but we would love to have you guys join us in this discussion. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Don't be afraid. There you go. I just have a comment. Um, I've already, Mary, I hope you don't mind that I'm sharing this, but um, if, if there's anybody in here who doesn't know the story of Jesus being and the fairy and uh, when Martin Luther King uh, came to Jesus being, you, you, you really ought to learn that story. I'm sure all of you already do, but if there's anybody who doesn't, but every, from the first time that I read that story, I was determined I was going to get to Jesus being. And last summer, my mom and I drove down and wanted to go to the collective. Because uh, I'm a quilter, I'm, I go by pattern. I'm not like these ladies. I have to have everything laid out for me. But um, when we got to the ferry, we didn't know where the collective was. And uh, the ferry was coming in, and there was one black person on the ferry who got off. And I asked him, where is the quilt collective? And he said, I'll take you there. My Aunt Mary Bendoff is the, uh, she's the director. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that's what he told me. <laughs> so we, we got to the collective and he said, her house is right down here. Do you want to go to her house? And I said, oh, I, I'm sure she doesn't want, you know, people visiting. He said, yeah, come on, just right around the corner here. <laughs> and what she was saying a minute ago about her mother teaching her never turning by the way. I mean, it was like, 105 degrees that day. It was hot. You were there in the winter. I've <laughs> <laughs> never been so hot in my life, but he went and knocked on the door and went in, and I thought, she's not going to want to see us. You know, it's, she doesn't know who we are, and she, he came to the door and said, come on. Hmm. And, and I had to pinch myself several times that I was sitting in Mary Bendoff's living room. And I had a quilt in the car that I was quilting, and I went out and got it, and she was quilting that day, and I, I have been to heaven, <laughs> and if, when I heard that uh, G's Ben, the quilts, and Mary Bendoff's collection is coming to Knoxville, I mean, I have been so excited about this. So it is just a pleasure to be here, and uh, my quilt group is, we're coming back tomorrow, so you'll get to meet all of them. Uh, <laughs> group. Linda, I was just, okay. I, see, I knew it. I was going to call on you to get this started and you're handing up. I knew you would. I'm really curious about the materials that you all use. One of the things I've been attracted to with your works, whether they be the quilts or the found objects and the sculptures that you make, Lonnie, are your materials and the feeling in those materials that actually convey something. Um, can you talk a little bit about the materials that you use? The material what I have in my is uh, I mostly use is uh, something some somebody in a wool. And when I when I get it, I know it'd be a good soft. And it'd be a loved in. And I like to put it in my quilt. So I get it and rip it up and put it in the quilt. And I get, if I don't have enough of that, then I get something else somebody on the wall and put it in there. And I make my quilt with love, joy, and peace in it. And I want somebody who's ever, not then but now, who's ever get the quilt, they can feel that love and joy in it. They can see it in my quilt. Because Making a quilt, it, it needs to be something that you can see, that you can feel, that the love you can feel in the quilt. I wasn't making a quilt at the beginning to go and bleed. I would make a quilt to keep on. But now when I make a quilt, I really don't care if it don't be sold. I still make it in a way and put it on my bed and I want somebody who should ever sleep in the bed to feel that love that I have in that quilt. Uh, as far as me and my way of choosing objects, I think all objects have a personality. If someone made that object, or if that object is found around a factory, or if that ob ob object is found in an alley downtown, and it might have belonged to, to an insurance company, where I find my material and what the material 
message finally be? It, it may be that one of the ladies out there could step on something. And if I see her step on it, I may not know her name, but because she stepped on it, it gives it an identity that that human has been involved with. Uh, I, I think I should think, think about a piece that's in the book, and when, if you are going to get the book, you're going to be able to sit down and read about the material that we use. In the book, I did a piece honoring my grandmother. My grandmother had had my father in a place called Goodwater, Alabama. Uh, so this put my mind on, on a journey of who I am. Uh, and she, before she died, she, she was 92 years old when she died. But she had carried such a load, she didn't get a chance to take and introduce me to my father's people. But she did introduce me to my father's place where he stayed. So I had worked where my father worked for this big lumber company in Goodwater, Alabama. So I went back there and I asked them could I have some of the scrap wood. And some of the wood that I got, I took one piece and it looked like a mask when I turned it over. I made my self -pro profile on it. And because of the wood being cut with saws, I thought of this piece of wood. And I, it, it, when I was cutting it, it a little chip fell out. So then I took a bunch of sawdust and wood glue, and I spread the wood glue all over the piece, and I put the sawdust on it. And I had a quilt that my grandmother had, and I wrapped the quilt around it, and I called it Wrapped in the Blanket of Time. Because what I was doing with that piece was honoring the mentality of my grandmother because in each of us there is a character or a placement of thought. In your mind you have to go in there and you have to find what, what, what these thoughts come from, what these thoughts of grandmother, grandfather, or the relationships with you and nature. So when I put this quilt on there, I was talking about the many things that come from grandmother's thought that will be wrapped around your head for you to carry. And I also wanted to give my father value for my life by saying I was not only a chip off the old block, but I was the sawdust, you see. So these are the things I said about that piece. And when you read about that piece, you'll see that I'm coming from personalizing this piece of wood I'm not trying to make a mask like all the other masses, but I made a mask to honor my grandmother's laboring to give my father life, and then my father giving me an opportunity to live. And when I go around these places, these different foundries are different places, you should see the many things that are done. And how I do them is that these things are personal because somebody worked to make them. Somebody wasted the debris. All this stuff you see going to the trash and the garbage. Stop calling it trash and stop calling it garbage and stop calling it junk and call it material. <laughs> give it, give it its honor where honor is due. Then we can deal with it better. We have a way of trying to delete something out of our mind. I don't want that trash no more. Get that trash out of here. But if you said research that material. Think about those objects. Then it's better for us to deal with it. We look at it in a, in, in a, in a learning mentality. Instead of, I, I got a big old 40-yard uh, dumpster full of junk garbage. I don't want to look at it that way. I, don't, I try to teach the children not to look at it that way. If it's a whole tree, how many times can you cut that tree, cut that tree, cut that tree, and cut it on down? I'm telling you, if it was me that had to teach them, that little small furniture you see up there, we'll be making small furniture. <laughs> we'll be appreciating a golden toothpick. Can you dig it? <laughs> we have to be able to dig it in order to have a better society because what I think Mr. Arnett have, have done with, uh, with the D. Ben Quilter's books, with Mr. Dow has something to say, with our uh, soul grown D. 
deep volume number one and two. He has given us an identity of materials that has surrounded us from Africa to America and beyond. Can you dig it? Actually, you know, Lonnie's approach to material and Mary Lee's approach is very similar. Even though, like Lonnie says, he's out in the in the streets and picking up things, uh, it's it's castaway materials that we as society have said no longer has value, and we get rid of it. It's the same with the materials the women use. It's as uh, I think it was in. Uh, I can't remember, I think it was maybe in Mr. Dallas, I'm to say, one of the big supporters of their work and has been for a long time, and really we should all thank every time we do a talk, is Jane Fonda, who helped put up the money to this. Yeah. You have a lot of these books published and to help bring this work to the public's attention, made the comment that the materials that the artists use are cast off the way their day and their culture have been cast off. And they take that and they give it new identity and try to give it meaning so that we can look at it and maybe understand something about Lonnie or about Mary Lee that otherwise we wouldn't we wouldn't pay attention to. Because you're trying to what? Do what? You're trying to make the king and queen happy. And throughout the ages, the artist always was trying to bring something for to be approved. You have to be approved. And when the king and the queen really, really did, saw something that they really, really liked it, we, did, we left them with a happiness. Maybe this right now, this society, our president, well, I think Mrs. Clinton did because she had my work in the White House. She showed me that she appreciated it. That was the first lady. Uh, her curator had to go to her and say, uh, Mrs. Clinton, this is what we got out there in America. Which piece do you want to choose? And she chose my piece called Leverage. I mean, I was, a, in a sense, I was considered to be a nothing in my mind. Here I am a nothing. But then when somebody sit down and look at your work and say, wow, this guy here put a lot of concentration, meditating and thought into this thing. And, and here it is in the White House Garden. How better can you feel? <laughs> How better can you feel uh, getting a letter from the Lords of London and saying, uh, Lonnie Bradley Hollis, senior? you have been chosen to be in a permanent exhibit at the Smithsonian. <laughs> or how, how great it is for you to have somebody to, to tell you through a letter, your works have been received in the United Nations. Uh, for every morning, the assembly got to go by our work and lead them. So it's not that I'm waiting on you to pat me on my shoulder or give me my awards for my work. I already have gotten that. But my thing is, I can't stop working now. Because who needs me the most? The little bitty babies that is yet to be born. That her, these young ladies can sit down and email back to China or Japan or whatever and say, we, got, we found a solution and it's in America. But it's going to have to be worked. Yeah. It's going to have to be worked. The blunder got to blend me this the, the stuff before you, can, before you can just drink it. It's got to be worth it. Excuse me. And we as a people, we got to be able to do what? And, and I remember a song that says, Go and tell it over the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. You know what I'm talking about? We are the society to go and tell it over the mountain. We are the society to tell the many armies and warriors that we appreciate you all. We appreciate them. We are the society to turn them away from oil dependency and, children and all this other stuff. We can break it up and particle it up and make a juice out of it. If what we have all, we have a car running on, on, on a, a, a smoothie. That's a new viewer called a smoothie. Probably not that far off. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a question. Since G's band has gotten such well-deserved and long overdue attention and appreciation, I'm just curious to hear from Lonnie, uh, Louisiana, Mary Lee about any changes that have occurred within the G's band community. Well, that happened. Uh, some changes, not. Well, 
there have been changes. We've, uh, like you said, gotten a lot of attention, and people are now coming into Jesus Band. And, uh, but it really hasn't changed. To tell you the truth, we don't really want Jesus Band to change. <laughs> we, you know, we, we like it, we just want to, but we, as the women of Jesus Band, we, we want to do something to leave a monument in our community to say that we went out into the world and we did something that people appreciated. So we're working on that now. But for as for for wanting to change to become a city or something, no. But it also has changed us. It brought our community back closer together. It has brought the women pride and it have brought the women a voice and and I think that's more important and of course it brought some some jobs in and and you know but but for us for different stuff like we, we just we just like being plain and simple. But it has done some changes. Well I think there's a you know, obviously, it's not the kind of thing they talk about, the, the access to money that they never had before is, you know, but again, in talking about the changes, you know, we as, you know, in America, we always, everything is always based on money. And G's Bend, historically, has not been a place, it's been a place where there wasn't a lot of money, so they didn't dwell on money. They didn't worry about money. They didn't have money, so they didn't worry about it. And as Nettie Young said, you know, everybody was in the same situation. Nobody had anything. And so whatever you had, you shared it with people. And in a way, the, the and, and I, I wouldn't have it any other way, but the, the money that comes in, it's great. But, you know, if you have art, you know, the women who are the artists who are traveling and making quilts and all of a sudden, you know, nobody will buy your quilt for $10, and then all of a sudden people are paying $20,000 for your quilt. It makes a huge change. And the women set up a collective to try to make it so that a few of the people didn't get all the money, that the money actually went around and helped everybody. But, you know, it's still a community, and as much as I like to think it's different from other places, and in many ways it is, but when money starts coming to a few, even though they're trying to share it with all, there are some who, who may be sitting there doing nothing, saying, well, why, is, where, why are you getting rich? What about me? I want what you have. And, and so, you know, it's kind of interesting how it's wondering, I don't think anybody would give any of the money back. Um, it's not the thing that's most important to them, really. I mean, it's nice to be able to help their families and you know, help grandkids and help pay for schools, schools and all that. But our friend Arlonzia Petway said, you know, you can keep all the money, just don't take this the way I feel away from it. Because I go places and people, you know, it was, you know, they were invisible. Nobody cared. And now they go places and somebody was talking about it, Louisiana was talking about it today with a guy from television. People listen to what we have to say. They want to hear what we have to say. We get to go talk in schools. We, they weren't even allowed to go to school. And now schools all over the country ask them to come sit in, you know, auditoriums, school auditoriums and talk to kids. And, you know, of all the success they've had and, and, you know, White House visits and being honored at the State Department and all of that, I think the most pride I've seen, the proudest I've seen any of them was we were on a trip to San Francisco and doing some work with some different schools and I had told the, the headmaster of the school that you know the women love coming to schools because they, you know, Mary Lee got to go to school just till sixth grade. Lou was saying, you know, until she was 18, she worked in the field every day unless it rained and then she got to go to school. That going to the schools was their biggest thrill. They loved it more than anything. And, when we went to the school, the women talked to the kids and talked about life and 
And then they said, we have a surprise for you. And they left and they came back and they gave all the women honorary diplomas from the school. And, and you, go to their, you go to their houses and it's like, you know, letter from the White House. And, you know, it's in a drawer somewhere with their diplomas from the same because they never had that opportunity. You know, and, and, and I don't mean to tell on Mary Lee, but I have to a little bit. Um, when Mary, somebody asked Mary Lee how the same question that Stephen asked, how has this changed your community? How has this changed you? And Mary Lee said, well, I can now do all the things I never thought I would be able to do. And of course you think, what, buy a new car, buy, you know, buy a bigger house? And she said, I can now help poor people. And it was like, hello, you're supposed to be one of those people that you're talking about. But they don't, you know, Nettie Young said it, and they all say it. They didn't see themselves that way. You know, we didn't know we were poor until you told us. Because they don't feel poor. You know, Nettie Young said poor is not in your wallet, it's in your brain. And if you don't feel poor, you're not poor. And they've never felt poor. Lou, again, said it today. We don't tell our stories because we want you to feel sorry for us. Because we don't feel sorry for ourselves. We tell our stories because we want you to know where we came from, what we endured, and what we've become. It's a happy story, not a sad story. Um, that being said, you know, not long, a few years ago, and I have to say this, because I think it's illustrative also of what changes have come in. I got a call, and I answered the phone, and it was Mary Lee's accountant, and he said, I'm trying to reach Mary Lee, but she won't answer her cell phone. So things have changed, but you never know that from them because they haven't changed. Their situation, their, their, you know, a lot of the factors in their lives have changed, but you never, you never know it. I don't. I, I have to remind myself sometimes. And there are times where we're out traveling and we get out of the cab and I reach for my wallet and I say, wait a second, you make 10 times more than I do, you pay for that. <laughs> But you never know. I mean, they haven't changed. I think that's fair to say. And that, that's a testament to who they are and their faith. And, you know, so, again, I thank you guys. Because it would have been very easy to forget who you were and where you came from. But they've never said no when the school said, can you come? And we don't have a budget. We're a public school. We can't afford to pay you to come. I've never heard them say no to go talk to a school. And that's with off, you know, they have a lot of opportunities, but those are the opportunities they never turn down. Matt, thank you so much. One more question. Last question. Yeah, the young people in G's Bend, are they showing any interest in learning the art of quilting? Yes. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but a few are. You know, we get more interest from schools than we do in our own community. But uh, a few have started that. And matter of fact, my uh, daughter, who's just 10, I have a, what, 12 year old <laughs> granddaughter. And, uh, and when I started back to sewing, they took interest in it. And they went, so at the time it was four and seven. And so I wouldn't let them sew. I told them, you know, they decided to do it with crayon and and paper. And I told them when they get older, I would teach them because I didn't, I didn't want to deal with the needles, with them being as young. <laughs> but anyway, you can see that quilt that my, I think she was maybe about five, when she drew that quilt. As a matter of fact, you can see it on the screen now, basically. And I did a design from her quilt that she drew, drew on paper. One question here, Chris. All right. <laughs> How did it all begin? Who discovered you, Mary Lee? Bill. Bill. Well, I would have to say, I would have to say, uh, y'all can blame that on the kind of relationship between myself and Mr. Arnett and what we were doing. Uh, and you, we ride. We was riding, and a lot of times we would see things on the side of the road that people had done. And um, 
These things live they are stranger than any other thing that somebody else did. Sometimes set apart. I set up or I call it placement. If you place something and it's peculiar, it's gonna stand out different than anything else. Some of us call it a green thumb. You may start having plants around you that's different from anything else you've done. It's those kind of things that is easy to spot when you're going up and down the road. So M Mr. Arnett, Matt's father, he had changed the mind environment. And he got, well, Mr. Arnett had been traveling all over the world. He didn't really have to do it because he was dealing with art from China, Japan. He had been to India, Africa. He had, you know, he had what I considered to be real art. And then when he came to deal with us, I'm saying, why would this man stop thinking about that real stuff to think about this stuff?